Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy. We have a development in the death of Starship 11. I thought the flight termination system was activated. A flight termination system is used to destroy a rocket if it goes far enough off course to be a threat to people on the ground. An FTS system is defined by the Range Commander's Council Range Safety Group of 2010 as follows. An FTS must control vehicles experiencing failure or degraded performance that can lead to a public safety hazard. Produce a small number of pieces with a small footprint. Control disposition of hazardous materials. Be supportable during assembly, test, pre-launch, launch, and flight operations. And demonstrate high reliability and probability of survivability of operating environments. The basic concepts of a flight termination system look like this and include Flight termination receiver. This is the device on the rocket that receives the termination signal, usually a digital coded signal these days. Antenna system, through which the signal is received by the device. An independent battery source, so that a failure of the rocket's main operating circuits don't affect the FTS. Safety lockouts to safe and arm the device and set timers. When you see these brave guys on a super high lift just before a Starship flight, they are removing the physical safety blocks and arming the FTS. A termination device, cutting charges and other explosives for fuel valves, cutoff relays, etc., that are sufficient to terminate the flight. And finally, FTS control and monitoring devices. Modern FTS systems have computerized automatic flight termination, so that if the onboard system detects a sufficiently significant anomaly, it can destroy the rocket without a ground command. This could be as simple as a GPS receiver that would activate the FTS if the rocket starts to go outside its designated flight area. These units have been used many times. Here you see SpaceX blowing up a grasshopper test device when it tries to escape by pointing itself toward the nearest horizon. The system on the ground that can manually send the signal that would make the rocket blow itself up is not usually a single exposed button. For obvious reasons, it usually has lots of covered switches. Here we see the ground FTS for the shuttle system. An FTS system used in the United States must meet the standards set by RCC 319, in which Chapter 3 sets performance requirements at the component, subsystem, and system level. Chapters 4 and 5 lay out testing requirements. Chapter 6 lays out our design requirements for the ground support and range safety system monitoring equipment. Chapter 7 lays out compliance requirements. And Chapter 8 lays out the documentation standards required by the government to prove compliance with these standards. Now that we fully understand the flight termination system, let me say, that wasn't what blew up Starship 11. Starship 11 was not a flight termination. As we watched the flight go up, we saw this. A fire on the side of one of the engines. Now we had seen little pieces of insulation burning in the past without being a problem. But this looks like a more sparkly fire, shall we say. What do all these little tubes do? Let's go back and review how rocket engines are started. If you're unfamiliar with the process, watch this in-depth, totally serious analysis. In short, starting your rocket engine is a big deal. A delay in starting of just fractions of a second can be fatal. Pressure-fed hypergolic engines are the easiest to start. You open a valve between the pressure tanks, usually holding helium, and the propellant tanks to pressurize the two hypergolic liquid tanks. Then you open the valves that allow the chemicals to flow into the combustion chamber, where they spontaneously ignite. This is why we used hypergolic engines to lift off the moon, and why we use them on the Dragon capsule for in-flight aborts. They are extremely fast and reliable. But what if you are burning kerosene and liquid oxygen? You can put an explosive fuel and an oxidizer together for as long as you want, and it will do nothing. Fumes or dust can build up in an enclosed space, like ships or grain silos, and absolutely nothing will happen until a spark occurs. A spark is a small point of high temperature. A spark can come from a cigarette or pipe which caused many ship explosions in the past, or it can be electrical and come from a shorted wire or even from static electricity. The Hindenburg had hydrogen gas trapped in cells to provide lift. As the cable was connected to the ground, the electrons that had built up on the ship during its flight jumped from the ship to the ground, creating an electric current and a spark. That was all it took to destroy this ship and end hydrogen-based lighter-than-air aircraft. Now the Merlin engine burns kerosene and liquid oxygen. Since these are not hypergolic, we need a spark of some type to set them burning. 
The Merlin engine uses a chemical that burns spontaneously at a high temperature on contact with oxygen. The chemicals used are called triethyl aluminum and triethyl borane, abbreviated TEA and TEB. And here's what they look like. A small tank of this chemical is connected to the engine. This causes the pretty green glow you see when some rocket engines start. Not to be confused with the pretty green glow you see when too much oxygen blow torches your copper alloy combustion chamber. These chemicals were used in the 1960s with the X-15 rocket plane and even the SR-71 J-59 jet engine. It's exceptionally reliable and has worked well for the Merlin. The start procedure for the Merlin would include adding a small amount of fuel and oxidizer, then adding a small amount of TEB slash TEA to start it burning. Once it's burning, you start pumping the huge amounts of fuel and oxidizer to power your rocket. This works great for the Merlin, but restarts are limited to how much starter chemical you have. If you run out of starter chemical, things can go bad. But carrying big tanks of starter fluid adds mass to your system. The Raptor engine is more advanced. It uses an electric igniter, just like an internal combustion car uses a spark plug. When the startup procedure is initiated, an automated program will release a small amount of fuel and oxidizer, in the case of a Raptor, methane and oxygen, into the combustion chamber, and then create a large electrical arc. The arc ignites the fuel and oxidizer, and before that fire goes out, you must pump more fuel and oxidizer in a controlled fashion. If you go too fast, you'll drown the flame, and it will go out. Go too slow and you might starve the flame, and it will again go out. Now all the maneuvering the Raptor engine has to do, along with the propellant tanks, while it's going from an upright position to a horizontal position and then very quickly back to upright, could possibly introduce bubbles of gas into the plumbing system of the engine and complicate this process. Now listen very closely to the sound from Starship 11 as they try to restart Raptor number 59. This sounds to me like a flame being snuffed out as you add fuel and oxidizer to the combustion chamber. Now if you run the startup sequence again, something dangerous can happen. The fuel and oxidizer pumped into the combustion chamber from the first failed start is still there. You don't have time to let it clear because your rocket is falling toward the ground. If you have two properly burning engines and you don't need the third, it would be a good idea to not try to restart it because lots of fuel and oxidizer in a small steel case is called a bomb. And that's exactly what happened when they tried again to restart the faulting engine. This is called a hard start and is like the backfire you can get from an older car. In this case, the explosion was catastrophic, blasting hot metal shrapnel into the other Raptors and into the fuel and oxygen tanks and blowing apart all of the ship except the nose, which you can see here. And that is why Starship 11 died. It may indeed be a hard start for Starship landing operations, but this is not an unfixable problem. Reprogram your engine startup computer. If you have two good burning engines and one misfire, don't try to restart the unneeded engine. Starship 15 has hundreds of design improvements over the Mark 1 Starships. I think it's likely that this will be one of them. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe and help us on Patreon if you can. We appreciate your support. At Astro Proterra. Thank you.